a little song we say to welcome our guests. Come on, y'all sing it. Glad you came. Glad you came to be a part of our fellowship. To experience this awesome move of God. This awesome move of God. There's a river that still flows. There's a river that still flows. Nobody really wants to fall. Come on, say it. Are you looking for something meaningful and life-changing to help you move through the challenges of life? For the next 25 minutes, then join Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church of Gastonia for an inspirational message prepared just for you. Hallelujah. Well, let's jump back into this message just to um, sort of bring us up to the place that we are this morning. Uh, we, uh, The Lord led us to do a blessing of the families going into 2014. And he gave us this message uh, and instructed us to talk about the family and, and the family's stability and strength against every all uh, that comes against it. And we understand that there are arrows. Now, uh, the background of the text this morning, you have read it. David uh, was dealing with an advisor, and David's advisor told him that he needs to flee to the mountains like a bird. And David says, listen, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And uh, why is it that you would even say to me that I need to flee? And so uh, his advisor says that um, you got to know that uh, the one who is against you is already uh, getting the arrow sharpened. He's already put practicing uh, shooting, and he's going to try to hit you secretly and catch you unaware. He says, because when the foundations are destroyed, in other words, uh, when people start using tactics and start using weapons that uh, are not uh, uh, right and moral, what can the righteous person do but run? And David starts out and says, I will not run, but my trust is in the Lord. And so we've been talking about that, and we understand then that uh, when we trust in the Lord as families, every family knows that the arrows that come against it won't stop. Right. All right? We're in a culture where arrows are being shot. And so every family must make a personal decision, as David did, to trust God through each circumstance for victory in your life. Now put your hands together and give God glory if you're going to put tr trust in the Lord for your family. We also have indicated that if we are going to be able to trust God and be able to war against the enemy as these arrows are coming to attack our families, that we must be prepared with what we call spiritual shields. Tell somebody shields. Shields. So we've got to be understand that when we put up our spiritual shields, it does not matter what arrows might come our way, we'll be able to deflect them in the name of Jesus. See, now when we're talking about a shield, keep in mind that a shield is a type of armor. It is meant to intercept every attack, to stop everything and to redirect the target from me back to the enemy. I don't know about y'all, but that's what I need. I need some spiritual shields. Ephesians 6 and 16 tells us, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So as Bishop says, the darts are going to come to our families, but if we have our shields ready, they will not penetrate. Tell somebody, not my family. So what, we, um, what we're doing is giving you some spiritual shields that you will be able to have up, that you'll be able to erect so when the enemy comes to attack your family, your foundation won't be crumbled. So last week we covered the first shield, and that first shield was family first. Family first. We talked about the first thing you've got to understand is that against all odds, we must learn to prioritize that our families are first. First simply means before your career, before your job, before your hobbies, before your sororities, your fraternities, your college, your buddies, your uh, family first. Everybody say family first. 
See, in the word of God, when we look at Genesis, the first chapter, down at about verse 27, the word says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, right? But now let's look at why he did the creation. Let's look at Genesis 2, 18. The word says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So in other words, God is saying you should not necessarily be alone. I really don't want you lonely, so I am going to make a helper for man. So what we have here is the beginning of family. Family is the first institution that God created, and if it was that important to God, it sure ought to be that important to us. Amen? So family first is our first year. We want to make sure that we keep our family first. What does that mean? If you weren't here, jot down these four S's that we covered on last week. To keep your family first, you need to make sure you support your family. Support means that you're there during challenges and aspirations um, through what they experience, but you are supporting. Then you want to make sure you're there for strength. Strength means that you're willing to lift somebody up in your family when they're going through. Then you want to make sure you're offering security. Security is that you're there to cover your family, to guard over your family. And then the fourth S is successes. You want to make sure that you are, are, are not there to be envious when someone is blessed, but you're there to celebrate all of the successes of your family members. So that's what we look at when we're talking about family first. When you prioritize family, that's a shield that the enemy can't penetrate. Amen? So that leads us up to today where we look at our second shield, the second shield of protection. All right, so now uh, jot this down. The second shield is family forgiveness. Somebody say family forgiveness. Family forgiveness. That's going to be a shield that's going to help block the arrows that come to bring destruction to your family. Now, in order for us to uh, get a good understanding of what family forgiveness is about, and we're talking about our immediate family as well as our extended family. And uh, we go to the Bible, and uh, it's such an extensive story that uh, you find in Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37, and uh, that's something that you can go back and read uh, the chapters leading all the way up to chapter number 50. But it involves uh, Joseph, the dreamer, and his brothers and the encounter and the experience uh, that Joseph had dealing with his brothers and how Joseph was able to forgive his brothers. Now, let me just kind of give you a snapshot of chapters 37 through uh, chapter 50 uh, with Joseph. Now, Joseph uh, was a dreamer, and uh, you know the story. Joseph had a dream, and Joseph's uh, dream was talking about uh, how uh, he had a sheave, and, and uh, his brothers had a sheave, and, and his brother's sheaves had to bow down to his. And, of course, uh, he was uh, uh, thinking about what God was going to do in the future. He didn't really fully understand it. He just shared with them his dream. Well, the brothers became a little angry with him because he had already been uh, the father's favorite. His father had given him a coat with many colors. And, and so the brothers were uh, angry. They were hostile toward Joseph. And they came up with this scheme that uh, they wanted to get rid of Joseph. All right. So uh, they uh, went out. When Joseph came to check on them, his father sent him to check on them in the field. Uh, they captured him and they threw him in a hole and they went back and told his father that uh, you know he was killed and they took his coat and they had sprinkled some animals blood on it and uh, they didn't actually kill him however they did sell him into uh, captivity with the Ishmaelites 
All right. The Ishmaelites take Joseph down into Egypt and they sell him into slavery. And uh, Joseph was a, a man of favor. And no matter where he went, he was favored. How many of you know when you're favored of God, I don't care where you show up, the favor of God will show up with you. I wish I had somebody in here. And so Joseph was made uh, as sort of the uh, leader of the household for a man by the name of Potiphar. All right. He worked for Potiphar and he was doing well. And of course, Joseph uh, must have been some sort of a looker, sisters, that because Potiphar's wife set her eyes on him. And she tre- kept trying to figure out the time and the place when she was going to have Joseph for herself. And uh, so she makes an advance toward Joseph and Joseph being a godly man resisted. As a matter of fact, uh, he ran out of the room and she caught uh, a piece of his cloth and tore it. And so since she was rejected, since she didn't take up uh, the past, since he didn't take up the past she made, uh, then she made up a lie. Y'all know that uh, hell hath no fury like that of a woman. Come on, somebody. Brother, I ought to get a brother to say amen in him. A mad woman. Huh? And that was the diary of a mad Egyptian woman. Mad woman. <laughs> because she, she then told her husband that this uh, Hebrew that you brought in tried uh, to, to rape me. And of course, then, you know, the uh, uh, Potiphar had loved Joseph and had given Joseph the full reign of the house. And he couldn't understand it, but he had to, you know, enact, you know, a consequence. So he throws Joseph into jail. He's in prison. But even in prison, Joseph had the favor of God on him. They made him the leader down in the prison. I wish I had somebody here. And so while he was there in prison, the, there was a baker and a butler that had dreams. And, and uh, he interpreted their dreams. All right. And uh, the time came for the butler to leave. And of course, he told uh, Joseph told the butler to remember me whenever you, you know, uh, get outside. And so the butler's there working for the Pharaoh. And uh, he hears about the Pharaoh having a dream. And none of Pharaoh's wise men could interpret the dream. So the butler says, I know a man that was in prison with us and he was able to interpret our dreams. Maybe you ought to send for him. So they send now for Joseph to come and interpret the Pharaoh's dream. The Pharaoh was the king uh, of the land. And so uh, he goes before Pharaoh. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. All right. So then because of the revelation that Joseph had, uh, Pharaoh says, I'm going to make you second in command. Uh, The only one you have to answer to is me. Isn't that something? My God, that's why you hear so many sermons about from the pit to the palace. Huh? Because or from prison to the palace, how God anybody know this morning that God can take you out of a broken, bad situation and elevate you even just because of the gifting that he put inside of you. I wish I had somebody. So he's in power. Now, the, the dream had to do with the fact that there were going to be some plenty of seasons and then there were going to be some years where it was going to be scarcity. So Joseph uh, 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 devised a plan for them to store up enough food so during the famine, uh, the land and the people would have enough to eat because the earth was not going to produce during that time. Now, remember, the brothers are, are back uh, at home. And uh, uh, Joseph's father is still in mourning because his favorite son is now dead, he thinks. So uh, the, the, they're into the first year and a half of this famine. And uh, the father says to the brothers, look, the only way that we're going to be able to su- survive is that we got to go down to Egypt. I understand that they have plenty there. So he sends a couple of his sons there. And when they go, they got to go to guess who? Joseph. Now, Joseph recognizes his brothers, but he does not immediately let on that he knows who they are. All right. And so he begins to, you know, inquire of uh, who they were and uh, asking about their father and so forth. And so he devises a way uh, to to get the brothers to go back and he wants them to bring back. Uh, the younger brother and he says one of your 
brothers needs to stay here while you go and get uh, the other brother. All right. So Joseph, uh, uh, at the end of the story, uh, he has all of the brothers to come to Egypt. They go before Joseph and Joseph has to now disclose to them that I am your brother. And you need my food. And he, they need his food. Isn't that something? You got to watch how you do people. I, I think I ought to say that. You got to watch how you do people. You got to watch how you treat people. And you got to watch how you deal with your family. Come on, somebody. This is family. There are all kinds of arrows being shot at the family. These brothers uh, had devised a scheme to get rid of their brother because of envy and jealousy. And now they have come and they have to come right back to the same brother. Now, I Bishop, let me inject that. Right. Isn't it something that it seems like the one that you're going to have to do the most for sometimes is the one that might treat you the worst? Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's just in my family. Maybe that's not in, re in other families. But it's almost like as soon, you know, the one that's going to need the food and need the nurture and need the care and need, may be the one that really might turn around and just spite you. But tell somebody, family forgiveness. Family forgiveness. Now, family forgiveness. Can you imagine <laughs> the look mm. on these brothers' faces That's right. when they discovered Joseph was alive and well? Mm -hmm. Huh? You know what? I believe Joseph must have said, uh, Tell the devil I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when they, they, now, imagine now, they, they are full of fear. They've had to come to the Pharaoh. They had to come to Egypt. They already didn't know how that was going to go. And now they've got to come. And this is their brother, the one that they had done so badly. But if you go to Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis chapter number 50. And beginning with verse number 18. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. Talking about Joseph. And they said, behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, get this, do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. Hallelujah. But God meant it for good. Somebody ought to shout right there. Because there's some stuff that's happened in you, even in your family. There have been some things. Come on, it might not be your immediate family. Maybe it's been some cousin. Maybe it's been some extended family. They did some things. They talked against you. They did some things to try to hurt you. But you ought to get the strength to say, you meant it for evil. But God. Somebody say, but God meant it for good. Huh? Because look, he said, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and, and your little ones. Glory to God. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Somebody say family forgiveness. Family forgiveness. Family forgiveness. Family forgiveness. Amen. That's what we need is family mm -hmm. forgiveness. Yeah. I wonder how many of us would have had that spirit. Mm. I, I, I won't even ask you to raise your hand. I won't even ask. But we do need to understand that no matter what we go through, we've got to learn about the word grace and the words grace and forgiveness. See, it's inevitable that we're going to have arrows thrown towards us. We're going to have issues in our families. We're going to have people that may not always appreciate us. We'll have people that may mistreat and do things that are ungodly to us. But we can't act like they act. We've got to act in the image of God. Amen. See, we've got to understand, let's look at Psalm 32, verse 1, and then again, verse 5. See, if we're going to exercise this forgiveness, we've got to first look at God's grace to us. Psalm 32, 1 says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So in other words, the first thing we want to see is that we have sinned. We have come short, but it's God's grace that's kept us covered. Is that right? Let's look at verse five. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity. 
I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity, uh, iniquity of my sin. My. So has God forgiven us? Hallelujah. Yes. See, God has extended grace to us, so we've got to make sure that no matter what, we extend the same grace to others. Let's look at Matthew 6, verse 14. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So, so look at somebody and say, we have no choice. No, no choice. But, you know, we want God's grace, so we've got to make sure that we're giving God's grace. It is a contradiction to the believer of God. To accept God's grace for you, but not be willing to give grace to others. See, we've got to understand we can't ask for any more than we're giving. Ephesians 4.30. Before, before you go to that verse. Okay. Did you hear that? It's a contradiction. Contradiction for All right? the believer. For us as believers mm -hmm. to want God's grace right. and accept God's grace. On what we've messed up on. And not willing to extend it to some others. Right. And sometimes I've discovered that it seems like the one that really needed the grace and got the grace was the very one that wanted to block grace for somebody else. Yes. In yes. other words, Lord, you know you messed up. Yes. You know what your stuff was. You know God gave, forgave you. Mm -hmm. and other people forgave you. Glory. Gave you another chance. And then when it's time for somebody else to get their second chance, you're going to be a blocker. Right. I don't think we ought to do it. I, I, huh? I remember how they treated me. That's I a contradiction mm -hmm. in your life. All right. Right. Let's look at Ephesians 4.32. The word says, Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another. Tell somebody kind. kind. Tender hearted. That's not grievous. That's not hard hearted. That's not, well, the way I do it to make me mad. I, no, tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Is that the word? Tell somebody that's the word. If we act in unforgiving ways, we open ourselves up for ungodly spirits to overtake us with these arrows. See, in other words, if we act hostile because somebody else did, then you become a hostile person. If you act angry, then your nature is to show frequent anger. If you act bitter because you're angry at what someone did and you're walking around holding on to that bitterness, then the root of bitterness will overtake you. Hebrews 12, 15. Let's look at that root of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Have you seen people that are just angry, just mad? You can't even say good morning without them spewing out venom. Those are people that have allowed a root of bitterness to overtake. We need to understand that that is not of God. The ill spirits will disrupt your peace and they will disrupt the nature of your family foundation. We must learn to forgive. Tell somebody we got to forgive. My, my, my. Listen, you know when you, when you allow a little bit of, a bit of root to remain, all right? Maybe there's some, some wild grass or maybe there's an old plant or something that you... You, you thought you had cut down. I remember we had these things, and um, I don't know what the bush is called, but it almost looks like a, something in the, in the desert, uh, and, they, and they, they just grow, and they have these corn stalk looking, you know, you put them out for decoration in the yard. And this thing started getting big, so I went out and cut it down. And I said, okay, this thing about to take over the 
driveway, the walkway and everything. And before I knew it, this thing had come back again. And now it's bigger now than it was then. Why is that? Because I thought I got root. rid of it, mm -hmm. but I didn't get rid of every root. You got to get rid of every, every root. Because if you don't get rid of that bitter root, it says it's going to come back and it's back. going to defile, defile many. Now understand that uh, people who are bitter don't like to see anybody else not bitter. Huh? They, they want to defile everybody else. They're going to be the one to find fault in everything. They're going to see the wrong and the bad and everything because they got this root of bitterness that they have not totally uprooted. And it's going to defile many. All right. So listen, um, let's help deflect the arrows with this family forgiveness. First of all, why is, the, why is it that we need to do it? We need to forgive. Listen, A, 80% of all murders are committed by people who have some relationship with the victim. Wow. Somebody gets angry, and there's a gun or a knife handy, and tragedy results. Just here the other week, uh, or this week, I read a story about um, this child who has lost both mother and father. The mother was killed in violence in 11, and just last week, the father was killed down in Tennessee or somewhere, in an argument with his girlfriend's father and he hit his girlfriend the father jumped in and before you know it boom they wow. knew each other all right they were within that family structure why we need to forgive let's look at b according to hospital records many parents have inflicted serious injuries upon their small children in fits of rage Small children are being harmed in fits of rage. That's why we've got to forgive. All right. C, one authority estimates that 60,000 children a year in America are beaten to death. That more children under five years of age are killed by their parents than those who die of disease. That's why we got to get forgiveness wow, and wow. get root of bitterness out of us. D, Besides hurting others, anger is killing us. It's killing us. You think it's not, but you hold on to that bitterness and you hold on to that unforgiveness and it's eating away at the core of you. Suppress anger and bitterness are causing problems in your health. If you're looking for dynamic worship, inspirational teaching, and a friendly atmosphere, you can visit us on Sundays at 221 West Bradley Street in Gastonia, North Carolina. For more information about our ministry, you can call 704-865-9016. To order your personal copy of today's message or any other broadcast, please call 704-865-9016 and indicate the broadcast date. Or you can just visit us online at www.friendshipgastonia.com. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast with Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. And remember, let God take control and let the Spirit flow.